Number 10. Stubbins Firth. When the yellow fever epidemic broke out in Pennsylvania, the University of Pennsylvania was conscripted to help find a cure. One of their many prestigious doctors was a man by the name of Stubbins Firth, and this man had a mission. He was determined to understand the root cause of the disease, and nothing would stop him from ensuring that this evil was defeated. Firth theorized that yellow fever was not a condition contagious disease, but instead related to the heat of the summer. To prove this, Firth decided that he would perform an experiment with himself as the subject. Firth then smeared himself in the bodily waste of patients infected with yellow fever, rubbing it into cuts on his arms, pouring it in his eyes, frying it and inhaling the fumes, and when that all didn't work, he just ate it. and. Well, he didn't catch the disease. However, it didn't actually end up proving anything about the disease, as the samples had come from already recovered patients. Years later, after his death, Cuban scientist Carlos Finlay would then correctly attribute the root of the disease to mosquitoes. Number 9. Paracelsus a deeply important figure to the world of medicine, Paracelsus was a Swiss doctor, philosopher, and just general weirdo. One of the key figures during the German Renaissance, he's known as the father of toxicology and a practitioner of hermeticism, wandering around the world before eventually taking up residency in Germany and teaching from the University of Basel. He was reportedly quite unstable, frequently under the influence of spirits, refusing to accept conventional medicine, and outright burning books he didn't like in protest, and just, you know, generally being a little freak. He claimed, get ready for this one, that it was possible to grow a man by fermenting sperm inside of a jar of horse dung, an experiment which he carried an example of with wherever he went. Number 8. Jose Delgado all right, everyone else on this list is pretty evil. The last two were just, you know, kind of funny. Jose Delgado was a Spanish doctor who worked out of Yale University. His research, on the other hand, was deeply disturbing. The neurologist's primary interest focused around the stimulation of responses in the brain using electricity, which he hoped to be able to use to force the brain to produce the thoughts and emotions that he wanted. In other words, actual mind control. And if that isn't terrifying, enough, he also ran experiments on anyone he could find, which usually ended up being people who were either schizophrenic or epileptic. One of his more famous experiments was the one where he used a remote control device to make a bull stop its charge. Number 7. Robert Liston Liston is an infamous surgeon who worked in the Victorian era. He quickly earned a reputation for being the fastest knife in the West End, and being able to amputate a leg in two and a half minutes. That did happen, by the way, and the patient died of gangrene. He also amputated one of his assistant's fingers for some reason, and uh, they also died of gangrene. Oh, and then, for some inexplicable reason, he lashed out at a surgical spectator who died from shock. What? I, either way, Liston was also known as the first surgeon to use anesthesia in Europe, so... Wait, no, what? Number 6. Giovanni Aldini If you don't know this guy, you'll know who he inspired. An Italian physician, Aldini worked primarily in the application of galvanism to the medical profession, which was the study of passing electricity through the nervous system to induce movement. His most famous experiment was in how he stimulated movement in the body of an executed criminal in London, which was recorded by the Newgate Calendar. Quote, On the first application of the process to the face, the jaws of the deceased criminal began to quiver, and the adjoining muscles were horribly contorted, and one eye actually opened. The report goes on to describe how the legs and hands were moved as well. A fearful visage for any bystander. Number 5. Andrew Yur. But this inspiration didn't just stop with Aldini, where the Italian walk, Yur sprinted. Working as a professor of natural philosophy, Yur would establish himself as a well-respected scientist, with a wide variety of focuses that he could claim mastery over. However, when Yur was approached by his friend and professor of anatomy, James Jeffrey, 
Jeffrey to aid in an experiment, Yur's writings on what happened next would catapult him into fame. Jeffrey had been working on a similar experiment to Aldini's, using the body of a criminal as a test subject and stimulating movement through the phrenic nerve. In 1819, Yur would record an incident where Jeffrey would display his discovery to the public, first moving limbs, then stimulating the eyes to open, and finally causing the contortions of muscles in the face to create terrifying expressions. Members of the crowd reportedly sprinted from the room in horror, and one man was even recorded to have fainted. Number 4. Robert Nelson One of the stranger entries on this list, Nelson's experiments could be argued as something between evil and just misguided. As it turns out, that division is pretty hard to define, as Bob Nelson's ultimate end goal was the ability to resurrect anyone. Starting as a TV repairman, Nelson would partner with an actual doctor by the name of Dante Brunel, and they would begin to develop a machine to preserve people in an early form of cryostasis. Putting out a call for subjects, they found themselves with an offer from James Bedford, a professor dying of kidney cancer which had metastatized into his lungs. As Bedford passed through legal death, Nelson and Brunel went about preserving his body with the hopes that he could be resurrected when the cure for cancer was discovered. Pumping his blood full of antifreeze, they stored the body in Alcor, the first of what would later number in the hundreds. Number 3. Robert G. Heath This scumbag was a psychiatrist working out of Louisiana, with his primary study being deep brain stimulation or DBS. Heath proposed that through DBS he was capable of influencing anyone to be able to change their mind, and thus he could cure mental illness through electrical stimulation. His claims were absurd, stating that he had successfully managed to give patients schizophrenia through blood transfusions and electrical shocks. As most of those patients died, it was fairly difficult to confirm this. He also claimed to find the cure for being gay. He claimed that he'd managed to quote unquote cure a patient of being gay, since that was actually considered a mental illness at the time. It's also implied that he had an involvement with the project MK Ultra, though this remains unconfirmed, but extremely plausible. Number 2. Ilya Ivanov A Russian scientist, if you couldn't tell immediately, Ivanov was a particularly strange scientist, the majority of his experiments revolving around two things. The first was the perfection of the method in which artificial insemination was done, which allowed for easier access to the technology, which was primarily used by horse breeders. His second interest was weirder. Ivanov apparently was extremely interested in creating a human-ape hybrid. Fortunately, he only attempted to do this through artificial insemination. Ivanov failed to create a pregnancy, but his legacy lives on as one of the most odd experiments ever conceived. Like, just why? Kicking off the list at number 10, George Chapman. This list is bad insane, so fair warning of the content that will follow. It's actually really dark. I try and be a silly goose whenever I can, but this list, honestly, I have like two bits, maybe in total. We'll see. So hang in there, is what I'm trying to say. Let's do it. Starting off with George Chapman. We're going back to the late 1800s for this guy. He began his career as a Polish doctor, but in 1888, he moved to London, and that's when things got dicey, to say the least. Once in London, Chapman sought out four mistresses, despite, as the late Rob Ford once said, having more than enough to eat at home. I'm happily married. I've got more than enough to eat at home. Thank yeah, he was our mayor. Fun fact, gotta love Ontario. But George Chapman was a doctor. He was a cheater and George Chapman was a killer. He poisoned all four of these women with arsenic. Chapman was executed for these crimes in 1903 and this guy was so bad that they thought perhaps he could have been Jack the Ripper. But that's since been disproven. So I guess he's still out there. That's a horrible thought to end on. That was just one out of 10. Like I said, buckle up. Number nine, Gwen Graham and Kathy Wood. This one is a two for one in terms of awful people. Gwen Graham and Kathy Wood. They were both working together at a nursing home in Michigan. But together, they both took the lives of five patients. They would do so by smothering them with a pillow. How awful is that? And to make this even more twisted, if such a thing can exist in this case, they did these attacks to prove their love to one another. Luckily, they were caught and locked up in 1989, but the fact that they worked together to carry out these attacks legit gives me the creeps. I didn't like typing about this or researching this. It's an awful thing to learn. This list is full of the worst doctors, but this pair, I don't know why, it just sticks with me right in here. Number eight, 
Elizabeth Wetlaufer. She was once a nurse at several long-term care facilities in Southern Ontario. Yep, really hitting close to home for this one. Elizabeth Wetlaufer would use lethal doses of insulin to end the lives of her patients. Now, after the patient had passed away, Elizabeth would then steal their opioids to support her own addiction. So it's bad, and then it just gets worse. In 2016, she quit her nursing job, checked herself into a psychiatric hospital, and confessed to all of her crimes. She confessed to eight counts of first degree murder, four counts of attempted, and two counts of aggravated assault. These happened from 2007 to 2016 in Woodstock, Ontario. So very close to where I am right now. Don't come find me and kill me, thanks. Elizabeth is now 55. She's serving eight concurrent life sentences, but after 25 years, thanks to Canadian law, she gets a chance at parole because, you know, second chances, am I right? There's things I love about being a Canadian, but like this, how they handle monsters like this is not one of them. Number seven, Morris Bulber. He was once part of the Philadelphia Poison Ring, which, yep, was a real thing. How horrible does that sound already? The Philadelphia Poison Ring. Okay, I'll talk about that first. It was led by these two Italian cousins, Paul and Herman Petrillo. This was back in the 1930s, and these two bros were perfect for each other in an awful way. Always the pairs, always the awful Paris. Harold was the arsonist who knew how to make counterfeit money, and Paul, he ran an insurance scam out of the back of his tailor business. Bad news in every direction. So already this awful duo exists, and then in comes Morris Bulber, this Russian Jewish immigrant who believed in something called La Fatura, which was this magical practice that Italians from South Philadelphia believed in at the time. Also so specific, just specific amount of Italians from Southern Philadelphia. Okay, just avoid that place, I guess. But this Dr. Bulber would give potions to their patients, and it was specifically patients from these because they issued insurance policies without medical exams, so they would get this Dr. Bulber to poison them with arsenic. The reason they had this scheme was because their insurance policies would then pay out the gang rather than the now widowed wives. How horrible is that? When they didn't need Dr. Evil, the cousins would just hire thugs to drown victims or hit them with their cars, horrible stuff like that. This kicked off around 1931 and roughly 50 people bit the bullet before he was finally arrested in 1939. And yes, he turned the evidence over so that these two cousins were also found guilty. Everyone got in this one. They were both sentenced to death. So just everyone got the most horrible treatment in every sense. Number six, John Bodkin Adams. He was once a general practitioner in the British community in Essex and most of his patients were that of the elderly and he treated those patients with care. From 1946 to 1956, John had around 160 patients that died suspiciously, and out of all those 160, 132 of them left valuables for him after they passed away. What are the odds, right? Now, of course, the wills were later found out to be fraudulent because, well, of course, this list exists. And the worst part of all this is that John was acquitted. His trial established the doctrine of double effect, which is where a doctor giving treatment with the aim of relieving pain may lawfully, as an unintentional result, shorten their life. But like that many times, come on. So out of the dozens of cases that ended horribly, Adams was only charged for two of them. He wasn't even convicted of their deaths. He was guilty of forging prescriptions and falsifying medical forms. He even reopened his practice afterwards, but this time around, patients avoided him. Number five, Jane Toppin. It's the 1880s and Jane Toppin, AKA Jolly Jane, is now confessing to 31 murders. With that nickname and that many victims, you're probably just as shook as I was writing this. Jolly Jane Toppin was a nurse working in Massachusetts. She would take care of the elderly as well. It's always something to do in that case, horrible. But instead of TLC, Jane would give them morphine and atropine. And while they were slowly fading away, Jane would do the absolute creepiest thing I've ever heard of. She would poison these old folks and then lie in their bed with them while they were passing away. Like literally beside them. That's the worst thing I've ever had to tell somebody out loud. That's horrible. I couldn't imagine doing something like this. She managed to take the lives of 31 patients before eventually getting caught. She spent the remainder of her days laying alone, thankfully, in an asylum. Number four, Linda Hazard. Her last name really tried to tip us off here. She has since been dubbed the starvation doctor because back in the day, the late 1800s, that is, if you somehow ended up in the office of Hazard, it doesn't really matter what you're there for. Linda's advice, no matter what, her medical advice, her professional advice for everything was too fast. Right, yeah, your knee's dislocated, eh, no problem. Just skip lunch, see how you feel. More than 40 of her patients died due to, well, you guessed it, starvation. And she even had her own sanitarium in Washington appropriately named Starvation Heights. You would think that after 16 deaths caused by starvation at a place called Starvation Heights, people would start asking questions. Now, eventually Hazard was caught, convicted, and served two years in prison. But 26 years later, in 1938, she herself died of starvation. You played yourself, Linda. Number three, Thomas Cream. This next one, again, hits close to home for us in Canada. Thomas Neil Cream originally graduated from McGill in 1876, and after that, he traveled to London, England, London, England, not London, Ontario. Definitely, definitely didn't travel there. The other one's way better. This was during the time of the Industrial Revolution as well, so the demand for doctors was 
quite high. Thomas was there for business and apparently he was there for pleasure. He enjoyed London's nightlife. He would dance, drink, and hook up with strangers. Just, you know, all the things you don't want your medical doctor doing hours before a procedure. On November 15th, 1892, there were thousands gathered outside the Newgate prison walls, eagerly awaiting the execution of one Dr. Thomas Cream. Hmm, what happened? Well, he's now referred to as the Lambeth Poisoner. We got another poisoner on this horrible list. If you had the misfortune of seeing this guy, odds are he would have just tried to poison you no matter what you went in there for. Just because. He just liked to do it. What a monster. He actually did get caught once. He was convicted of poisoning a woman once. He was given life in prison, but it's all about who you know, right? His brother ended up bribing the governor of Illinois at that point, so he poisoned five more people after in London before eventually getting caught and arrested again. And then finally, this time around, he was executed. And this time around, there was also a crowd. Rightfully so. Number two, Michael Swango. When he was just a child, Michael Swango did not collect rocks. He didn't spin Beyblades with friends. He didn't have Pokemon cards or anything like that. Instead, he had scrapbooks filled with horrible car accidents. Or any crime scene that's awful to look at would be in the scrapbook. As if there weren't any red flags there alone with what I just said, when Michael got to college, he decided to write his chemistry thesis on Georgi Markov. And more specifically, he studied his horrific death caused by, you guessed it, poison. He was fascinated after that point, he had a newfound obsession, and it was poisons and how they silently took lives. This was intriguing to somebody. Now during his third year at school, five patients that had the misfortune of seeing him just happened to die afterwards. Big mystery. Hmm. His classmates actually had a nickname for him, which is horrible. They called him Double O, in reference to James Bond, 007, but more of a reference to License to Kill. You think people would ask questions? I don't know. After an internship, people of course were dying off, but one individual luckily survived. And she remembered a few important details. She remembered that Swango had injected her with something just a minute before she started experiencing seizures. He still got away with it somehow, and then later he went to another hospital in Ohio in 1984, handed out donuts that made the staff sick, and then when they required treatment, he would help them, but really he'd poison them. He got caught then, was sentenced to five years, but was released after two. He then changed his name, moved to Virginia, got a job as a career counselor, and poisoned those co-workers as well. He got caught again again after doing this like three more times, and now he's serving three life sentences at ADX Supermax Federal Prison. This is actually insane. If I told you everything that he actually got away with, like I crunched it down, this video would be too long if I included it all. You'd think it was a marathon here on Most Amazing. Nope, just the horrible acts of one Michael Swan. And finally, number one, H.H. H. Holmes. H.H. H. Holmes was of an absolute monster, just a horrible human being. His fascination with medicine started at a young age as well. He used to perform these surgeries on stuffed animals, which is just, again, red flags. It's never been confirmed, but it's highly believed that his first victim was one of his first friends. H.H. went to go on to medical school, and shortly after finishing, he began killing people in order to steal their property. How insane is that? He then built himself this huge, horrifying home, this house that had like tunnels and trap doors and doors that locked from the outside and all that super villain crap. He even had to kill him to cremate these bodies in his house. That's, you know what I'm talking about, one of those guys? I think it's safe to say he was absolutely the worst person on this list. I mean, not that we're trying to compare, but kind of hard to be more evil than this guy. Not only would he get close to women to take control of their finances and then kill them afterwards, but he would also require his employees to take out life insurance policies that named him as a beneficiary. Some of these bodies he ended up selling to medical schools, which is just... I can't even go down that road of huh. Eventually he was found out, luckily, and he was caught and sentenced to death. Now it's not exactly known how many victims he had, but it's thought to be somewhere in the 200 range. Disgusting, right? That's what this list is all about. Kicking off our list at number 10, mini brains. Yeah, mini brains with little tiny mini eyes. That's where we'll start today. Yeah, welcome back, I guess. August 2021, a strange but daring group of scientists announced that they had grown a little human brain, equipped with its own set of eyes. Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually not called a mini brain, of course, that's a bit much. Its scientific term is organoid or organoid. I'm not really sure. Organoid sounds like something you'd order at a restaurant. An organoid. Sounds like an instrument. The entire goal here was for scientists to understand eye disease furthermore, right? These organoids, <coughs> these organoids come from stem cells and ideally growing organoids allows researchers to study how organs develop and provide new information into how organs could react early to specific treatments. So they're like little mini tiny what ifs and little signs, little tiny balls of what ifs essentially that have eyes. They're really kind of gross to look at. Little brains with eyes equals science. The more you know, 
Number nine, daddy short legs. I'm not a fan of the bug or its name. So here we go. Calling a bug daddy or like daddy long legs, that's so weird to me. I don't, I've never liked that. Even as a kid, I'm like, that's, that's not right. Now we might have to add daddy short legs to the mix. That's a real thing. A lot of dads in the bush. Let's talk about them. Scientists have recently created a version where daddy long legs' legs are stunted at birth. Therefore, they're daddy shorter legs. By doing this, they were able to study what they looked like millions of years ago. The daddy long legs right now it has a unique way of hunting and moving around but once the legs were shorter it almost went back to a form of travel that could only be seen 400 million years ago it started to move differently which is kind of cool how far back do we need to go to uh, get rid of the word daddy that's my next question is that 500 million years maybe 600 it's a weird a bug named daddy why do we do this? Number eight, undead as a dog. Any dog lovers out there? Awesome, hit that thumbs up and also maybe skip to the next one. I don't know. A team of Russian scientists released a video in which they showed a few dog heads that were being kept alive by an artificial blood circulation system. No, we're not gonna show the video sickos. But we can certainly talk about the video. I can do that for you. In the video, the scientists use a heart lung machine and they're able to show the dog's head responding to sound. Now, scientifically, that's wild. That's a feat, no doubt. Awesome. You guys nailed it. But walking into this room by accident, that's got to be pretty jarring, pun intended. They would wiggle their ears, they would blink their eyes, and sometimes they were even able to lick their mouths. So that's a terrifying thing to imagine. All, all just one head. In 2005, for some reason, American scientists began to try and recreate this horrifying experiment. So they flushed out all the blood from a dog and replaced it with oxygen and sugar saline, all that horrible stuff. And then three hours after this, and then after a blood transfusion and of course an electrical shock, the dog somehow was brought back to life. Yeah, I, I wish I knew the purpose or like the end game of this experiment, but couldn't tell you. I mostly wish I just never knew it, to be honest with you, and that we never included it, but that's, that's too late. Number seven, robot dog. This one's a lot better, I promise. Nothing like the last one. Imagine meeting a cyborg version of you. Imagine being a dog and you had to meet another cyborg dog. That's gotta be pretty horrifying. Well, that was the pitch back in 2003 when researchers from the University in Budapest and the Sony Computer Science Laboratory in Paris got together. Yeah, a dream team, some would say. The world was never the same. They're like, should we make Spider-Man movies? They're like, yeah, should, this first, this first right now. And put this robot dog near the real dog's food. So when the real dog ate, it was growling, it was watching this other thing, and then ultimately, it took a chomp and threw it across the room, this robot dog. It could be the fact that something was near its food source in general, but still probably uneasy that a robot dog is staring at it like, you know, let's try to eat. Imagine that in the morning, just looking at you, it's like, hey, am I bugging you? You're like, Kind of, yes. You can buy Abo, the cyborg dog, for an easy $3,000 right now. Or you could adopt, you know, that's always great and preferred too. Number six, Stubbins Firth. Okay, this is one of the craziest science projects I have ever heard of. We're getting a little real now, here we go. A researcher from Pennsylvania back in the late 1700s, well, first of all, as you can probably guess, methods back then were gross. They were really messy. They didn't know what they were doing. A lot of firsts in the medical science world, including Firth. Firth was a doctor in training at the time, and he decided to prove to the world that yellow fever was not contagious. Yeah, imagine if he had Twitter right now. You know what I mean? Firth would surgically insert vomit, you know, like vomit from patients with yellow fever. He would insert that liquid of vomit into his body. He would put this stuff in his wounds, all over his face, his eyes, his pores. He was trying to get it in everything. He was purposely going the extra mile, all in the name of medical research. That's, I'm gonna throw up now. This is so gross. Even urine or saliva, anything that was, you know, in your body, just pour it on, that's it. Just like in Uh-Oh, that TV show where the guy dumps the bucket of goop on the person who gets the trivia question wrong. Just like a bucket of that stuff, just poured right on. And to everybody's surprise, he did not get sick afterwards at all. He was pretty proud of that one. He told everybody this scientific breakthrough. We look back now though, and we realize that Firth just sampled late stage patients. So they were further along, much further than the contagious period. So basically he did all this for nothing. He volunteered to dump all over his, ah, uh, yeah. History's gross, science as well, very gross. Just a lot of, a lot of gross firths in the community. Number five, the monster study. Speech pathologists, miracle workers, most of the time, 
except for 1939. Back in 1939, speech pathologists at the University of Iowa, they were determined to crack the secret behind stuttering. You know, if you find out the key source, then you can kind of trace back to the problem, yada yada. Sure, I get it. But they believed that it all began with young adults and their fear of public speaking. So these researchers decided to intimidate people and try and induce stuttering. Yeah, they got patients who were showing signs of stuttering early and they verbally attacked them. They kept telling them they shouldn't speak unless they're sure they can do so properly. Properly. They were yelling at them, making it very intense on purpose. The experiment did not induce stuttering at all, rather it induced extreme anxiety. Yeah, obviously. Hence why it was referred to as the monster study. Three of these patients later sued Iowa and the university for 925,000. Yeah, you can't be scaring people. Number four, Francis Crick. As we go on further, we kind of have to have a laugh. You know, the last few have been pretty, pretty f***ed up. Back in the early 1900s, Francis Crick, AKA the guy who discovered DNA, alongside James Watson. Two brilliant minds, dare I say, these life-changing discoveries. Well, it was also announced back then that they also believed in directed transpermia, meaning that humans were put on this planet by aliens. Yeah, like extraterrestrial, like, like aliens. That's what they fully believed in. The DNA guys, believe that we're aliens. So you're like, okay, what's right, what's wrong? What do we do here? Some of his methods involved conversations to patients, real patients, he was a doctor. He'd be like, hey, let's talk about DNA. Also, did you know that aliens planted us here? Cool, I'm Francis Crick. No, that's alarming, don't do that. Number three, worm diet. Apologies if you're eating right now. I know myself, I like to snack out and watch YouTube videos late at night. This one, maybe not, maybe skip this one. Hit the thumbs up and skip it, it's really gross. Back in 1878, Giovanni Battista Grassi covered himself with worms, all in the name of science. His trick, well his method rather, was to ingest worm eggs, which he kept after autopsies. That's horrible. That's the worst thing I have ever heard in my entire life. Weird hobby, even weirder project. Some parasitologists would argue that this project changed the game and, you know, improved their medical knowledge, yada yada. But I still think it's the grossest thing that I've ever heard on this planet and who would do such a thing? I had to mention it. Science rules, I guess, right? Science rules, Blah. Number two, inner armor. We've all wanted to be a superhero at some point, you know? When you're watching the movie halfway through, you're like, you know what, I really do want that. I want that technology just blasted on my chest, sure. Well, DARPA's inner armor project was the Pentagon's way of creating super soldiers. Scientists use animals as reference for these new abilities, like literally from a Marvel movie. Right now, they're studying the DNA of the stellar sea lion because it can reduce blood flow away from organs if need be in order to reduce oxygen demand. So that would be pretty sweet. You can just stay underwater forever, ideally. That's a cool superpower to have, I guess. Dr. Michael Callahan, who is in charge of running this whole operation, he says the goal is to make soldiers kill-proof against disease, chemical weapons, radioactive weapons, harsh weather conditions, everything, you name it. Now, this was back in 2007, and of course, in 2014, Barack Obama announced that the United States is building Iron Man armor. Put these two together, we have Superman, I guess. That's exciting on one hand, but do we think this is a good idea? Like, where is this gonna go? What if somebody decides to be an awful human being wearing all of these, you know, vests of armor? Am I crazy? Comment down below if you think an Iron Man suit of armor would be a good or a terrible idea. I vote terrible. And finally, number one, go pills. Look out, five hour energy. It's game over, pack your shit, you're fired. These guys have you beat. Every time I watch Lord of the Rings, I fall asleep. Look, I can't help it, it's a great film, sure, but it's just so cozy, the music, it tucks me right in, I don't know. But that's not an issue in the real world, is it? No, not at all. Overnight truck drivers staying awake all night, military personnel that needs to be awake all night for operations or for days at a time, that's a bit more important. Definitely. And that's where go pills were supposed to come in handy. The pill that keeps you up for 40 hours straight. 40 hours, that's insane. The US Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA for short, is currently funding this pill. Would you want this? Would you ever touch this? I wouldn't do this personally. The benefits it would have, they sound great, but again, right now they're not sure if the long-term side effects are worth it. You don't want people hallucinating mid-flight. Know what I mean? That's. That's bad news. But I'd get through a game of Mario Party 50 turns, so. Mm. 
Coming in at number 10, Christopher Dunch. Once upon a time, Christopher dreamed of tackling a career in football. However, despite an appetite for the game, he lacked the talent to pursue it professionally and eventually decided to switch to a career in medicine. By 1995, he completed his undergraduate, and so next he shot into the prestigious MD PhD program, completing it in 2010. However, despite all this heavy duty training, colleagues began to notice that something just wasn't quite right about him. Some believed he was under the influence at certain times, and others blatantly confessed they would never let him operate on them. Still, looking good on paper, Christopher managed to get a job as a spinal surgeon. Not long after, a trail of bad news began to follow him. Patients were suffering strange complications from his operations, one almost dying from infection, another had a surgical sponge left inside, and colleagues began noticing that he would regularly misdiagnose patients or even perform unnecessary surgeries. Thankfully, his evil habits caught up quickly, and by 2013, the Texas Medical Board revoked his license before a major lawsuit began the following year. As it turns out, during his residency, he performed fewer than 100 surgeries compared to the usual 1,000 or more, and this lack of expertise eventually killed two people, paralyzed another two, and injured countless others. But what's even sicker about all of this is that he wasn't just some clueless idiot. In a 2011 email used against him in court, he allegedly said, quote, I am ready to leave the love and kindness and goodness and patience that I mix with everything else that I am and become a cold-blooded killer. So with the blood of 33 patients on his hands, Dr. Dunch was sentenced to life in prison for the maiming and injuries caused to his patients. Next up at number 9, Jayant Patel. The doctor of death, as coined by the media, Patel worked in both the USA and Australia and is believed to be responsible for the death of as many as 87 patients between 2003 to 2005. Trouble began following Patel as early as 1984, after he was fined five grand and suspended for three years for failing to properly examine a patient before surgery. Then fast forward a few years to 1995, and Patel was once again in hot water after colleagues began complaining that he would perform surgery when not rostered to work, would operate on other surgeons' patients, and was routinely causing serious injury and even death. Because of this, his hospital began restricting what surgeries he was allowed to perform, and so likely trying to get away with his evil deeds, Patel transferred to an Australian hospital in 2003, where he somehow managed to become a director of surgery despite his lack of qualifications. However, the staff at this new hospital caught on quick to his incompetence and would hide patients from him in fear that he would hurt them. Finally, in 2010, he was found guilty and sentenced to seven years behind bars, as well as being barred from practicing medicine ever again. Next up at number eight, Jack Kevorkian. During the mid to late 90s, Dr. Jack Kevorkian became a notorious figure in the media after becoming a champion for a terminally ill patient's right to die, despite the laws that prohibited it at the time. Now, compared to others on this list, he's definitely in a much grayer area, but even so, by 1999, he was convicted of second degree homicide for his role in the voluntary euthanasia of over 130 patients. However, that wasn't where all the controversy began. Earlier in his career, he fell under similar criticism after proposing that medical experiments be performed on death row inmates who choose to do so, arguing in his 1959 paper that they could provide a service to humanity prior to their inevitable fate. He garnered very little support for his ideas, and by 1980, he shifted focus to the ethics of euthanasia. By 1987, he started advertising his services as a death consultant, and by 1989, his first patient, Janet Adkins, sought out his services. After the assisted death became public, they were not initially able to charge him as there were no laws surrounding euthanasia. However, Jack's medical license was revoked. Despite this, he continued his services for the terminally ill and was eventually arrested in 1998. Through the trial, his reputation earned him the nickname Dr. Death, and he ended up being sentenced to 10 to 25 years for his deeds. However, despite the negative narrative, the doctor always fought back, claiming to be aiding the terminally ill and their lives on their own terms, and famously once said, quote, dying is not a crime. Coming in at 
at number 7, Morris Bulber. Nicknamed Dr. Mob due to his affiliations with the infamous group, Bulber was a physician in the 1930s who became notorious for his involvement with the Philadelphia Poison Ring. It all started with Italian cousins Herman Petrillo, a counterfeiter and arsonist, and Paul Petrillo, an insurance scammer who ran a business out of his tailor shop. By 1931, the insurance scam killings began taking place, and hired thugs would track down their victims, ending their lives in brutal ways so the cousins could claim the life insurance. Soon, Dr. Morris, who prescribed to La Fatura Magic and was known to provide his patients with strange potions, became involved in the operation, and he and the cousins began preying on unhappy, gullible, or sometimes even villainous housewives, issuing them love potions that would either cure their abusive husbands or potentially, wink wink, kill them if they were irredeemable. At least that was the company line. In reality, there was no love potion at all, rather expensive vials of arsenic accompanied by excessive insurance policies that favored the gang over the soon to be widow. Eventually in 1939, the jig was up and after being involved with the death of 30 to 50 people, Dr. Mob was arrested and offered up evidence against the cousins in exchange for a life sentence instead of the death penalty. Coming in at number 6, Linda Hazard. Unlike the others on this list, Dr. Linda Hazard was not a medical doctor, but instead a woman who managed to receive a license to practice medicine through a loophole that grandfathered practitioners of alternative medicine. Author of the books Fasting for the Cure of Disease, Diet in Disease and Systemic Cleansing, and Science scientific fasting, the ancient and modern key to health, Hazard believed that all illnesses were the result of excessive eating, and that literally any disease could be cured with enough restriction. With her belief in mind, Hazard went on to develop a specialized hospital where she would force patients to fast for weeks or even months, providing them only occasional and small amounts of tomato, asparagus, or orange juice. But that wasn't all. On top of starving her patients, Hazard also prescribed daily enemas, and patients were often beaten by the staff. Over the years, 40 patients died from her treatment, but it wasn't until 1912 when Dr. Linda was finally convicted of manslaughter after it was discovered she forged a patient's will who died at a staggering 50 pounds and made herself the beneficiary. The quack was sentenced to 20 years, but was mysteriously pardoned two years later and eventually died from her own program of starvation. Coming in at number 5, Hu Wanlin. Born in 1949, Hu Wanlin only ever received a primary school education and tragically began getting in trouble with the law very early on. Already a convicted felon, Hu was actually in prison, serving 15 years for killing a businessman as well as trafficking young women, and shockingly, it was while he was behind bars that he began practicing medicine. In 1993, Wanlin began posing as a doctor specializing in ancient Chinese medicine and managed to open a practice from prison where he would prescribe herbal treatments that were actually fatal amounts of sodium sulfate advertised as medical miracles. Then in 1997, he was released from custody and despite having no legal certification, continued on with his miracle medicine practice. However, by 1999, he was once again arrested on the suspicion of causing nearly 150 deaths, found guilty of illegally practicing medicine, and sentenced to 15 years behind bars. Next up at number 4, Harold Shipman. Nicknamed the Angel of Death, Harold Shipman is not only a terrifying doctor with a prolific history, but is also one of the most infamous killers in British history. Born in 19 46, in his youth, Shipman was very close to his mother, but sadly she suffered from lung cancer and died in 1963 when Shipman was just 17. Now it's likely that this death had something to do with his later decisions in life, as after her death he enrolled in medical school, graduating in 1970. Soon after his graduation, he began working in the field, and by 1974, Shipman began working as a GP, and that is when things 
began to go south. Shipman began discreetly killing elderly patients and managed to slide under the radar for many, many years. But by 1998, other doctors around began to notice the high death rate among his patients and became quite concerned that some malpractice might be at play. An investigation began and eventually they discovered he had been responsible for the death of an estimated 250 of his patients, each with a forged death certificate stating they died of old age and some even with forged wills. In reality, Shipman had been purposefully overdosing elderly women, mirroring the last few days of his mother's life, and for his crimes he was sentenced to life. Coming in at number 3, Maxim Petrov. Between the years of 1999 and 2000, Maxim Petrov was a physician responsible for the death of 11 people. Initially, he started out with home invasions. He would go to patients' houses on strange, unannounced home visits, measure their blood pressure, and suggest they needed an injection. Petrov would then quickly administer just enough medication to make them pass out, but not enough to actually kill them and promptly rob their homes. However, it all took a turn on his 13th robbery when the daughter of the anesthetized patient returned home mid-robbery, and Petrov immediately stabbed the crime witnessing daughter and then strangled the knocked out patient. From there on out, it seems like he decided to change his motives and would use a lethal mix of a variety of different to take the victims' lives rather than just put them to sleep, purposefully using a variety of in an attempt to throw off police from him having any medical knowledge, he would rob the houses, then set them on fire to destroy the evidence. But authorities eventually found the link between all the victims. They were all lung patients on the same list. And later, when Petrov went to visit another of the patients on that list, officers arrested him and he admitted to his wrongdoings. Initially suspected of committing 19 killings, he was only confirmed with 11, but still sentenced to life in prison, where he remains to this day. Coming in at number two, Michael Swango. When it comes to creepy doctors, this guy might just take the cake. After graduating high school in 1972, Two, Swango enrolled in the Marine Corps. However, by 1980, not long after he joined, he was honorably discharged and decided to head to medical school instead. His creepy behavior started early on. While in school, although a bright student, he preferred to work as an ambulance attendant and was described as having a strange fascination with dying patients. In fact, although no one put the pieces together until later, many of his assigned patients mysteriously ended up coding, at least five of whom actually died. Next, he managed to get into an internship at Ohio State University, but it didn't take long before nurses began feeling that something was deeply wrong with him. Patients that seemed perfectly fine were suddenly dying while under his care, and one nurse even witnessed him administering a strange needle, despite that the patient's chart didn't require it. Eventually, the internship ended, and he moved to Illinois and began working working as an EMT. This time around, he began not only hurting patients, but his colleagues, administering poison into the food he would bring into work. Now here is where it gets insane. He was actually arrested for battery following the poisoning of fellow EMTs and went to prison for five years. After his release, however, knowing he would not be able to practice medicine, he legally changed his name and began forging his way into hospitals. Once someone found out the truth, he would move and this goose chase eventually sent him out of the country to Zimbabwe. Thankfully, the FBI caught up to him, arresting him in 1997 for his multiple felonies, and this monster responsible for the death of an estimated 60 patients was sentenced to life behind bars. And last up today in our number one spot, Herta Oberhuser. We all know that during World War II, there were hundreds of so-called physicians performing unspeakable experiments on prisoners of the death camps under the guise of medicine, and one of these horrible monsters was Herta Oberhuser. In 1937, Dr. Oberhuser obtained her medical degree and soon joined the infamous German party, becoming a doctor for the League of German Girls. By 1940, she became the assistant to Karl Gerbhardt, chief surgeon of the party, as well as the personal physician of Heinrich 
Himmler. However, her biggest atrocities on humankind came in 1942 when she began working at a woman's only death camp conducting experiments on its prisoners under the guise of finding better methods to treat infection. Her experiments, however, were far from real medicine. She would deliberately wound her victims before contaminating the open wound with bacteria, sometimes even sticking rusty nails, sawdust, or bits of broken and glass into the affected area. From there, Oberhuser would watch as the women writhed in agony, observing the effects until their death became imminent, at which point she would kill them with an injection of gasoline or another substance, causing them an agonizing death that took about five minutes to complete. Finally, once they were dead, she would dissect the bodies for further experimentation. Now, what is insane about this doctor is that despite being a part of the doctor's trials once the war was over, she was merely sentenced to 20 years compared to some of her colleagues who faced life. Even more insane is that she was released early for good behavior and actually attempted to open a practice after her release. Thank God, protesters forced to close, and in 1958, her medical license was finally revoked. Starting our list off at number 10, Ilya Ivanov. Beginning in the late 1800s, here we go, Soviet biologists, they actually got permission from the country to breed hybrid ape humans. What did you get up to last summer. <laughs> I'll never tell. She grafted an ovary into a chimp and the goal was to fertilize Nora, the chimp, with human DNA. So they inseminated a group of chimps. None of them got pregnant so instead they tried to flip the project up. Now this time they had a human inseminated with the DNA of chimps. Yeah, the other way around. The, the, the volunteer number was low, obviously. Now before anything actually happened, this would have been an absolute train wreck. Before the project was underway, he was sent away to Kazakhstan. So we didn't get any more science projects after that point, thankfully. Yeah, let's just leave uh, monkey alone. Number nine, human monkey hybrid. Guys, I wish this was fake, but it's not. So scientists, they're currently trying to make human monkey hybrids, like the title just said. They have high hopes that these experiments will succeed because monkeys and humans are similar genetically. So obviously, we're going to try a few times. Spanish biologist Juan Carlos Esbisula Belmonte is working with monkey researchers in China right now to perform these experiments. So basically, they're mixing human cells into monkey embryos and then just they're just going to see what happens, I guess. I don't know. Hope it goes well. Their objective is to grow a monkey whose organs are completely made of human cells. Doesn't that sound just terrifying when I say it out loud like that? Then they would use said animals and their organs for people that need them. Yeah, of course this is a little bit controversial in a few ways, so let's just keep moving on. Number eight, Jose Delgado. Okay, we're talking about mind control, so I'll give you a moment to put on your tinfoil hats. You might need those for this one. In the early 1900s, Jose Delgado graduated from the University of Madrid. Even lands a professorship at Yale University, but his mind, the whole time, his mind was focused on others. He had other ideas going on. He was committed to mind control, and his go-to method was implants. Yeah, electrode implants, first used with, you guessed it, primates. Yeah, three for three. Weird. He would use a remote control to make them do certain moves, even, you know, moving on to mind controlling a bull. So he was kind of changing the animal game up as he went. He liked to improvise. He got in the ring with said mind controlled bull, but then oddly enough, the bull was calm. It didn't attack. That's weird. Almost like there's an implant in his brain and he doesn't want to do anything. Reports say he stopped the bull last second before it charged. I call bull. I say there's a thing in his head and he wasn't sure what was up the entire time, the little poor lad. And then next in the project line came the people. 25 people were tested on with said mind control device. Yeah, by electronically controlling the brain. He believes armies could be controlled down the road and until his death in 2011, he was upset that he wasn't cited as often in terms of mind control project in recent studies. Yeah, weird. Guy who mind controlled animals in the 1900s. We're trying not to do that maybe. I don't know, that's why we're not talking about you. Number seven, see through frogs. Here we go, just when you thought frogs were already hard to spot, boom, now they're invisible. Good luck catching them. Back in 2016, through artificial insemination, scientists successfully took the DNA of two kinds of recessive color frogs, black-eyed frogs and gray-eyed frogs. Then they combined them together to create a frog whose skin is now always translucent. They made, a, they made an X-Men of a frog. We love it. The see-through factor allows observation of organ growth or cancer formation. That's the human science thing. And it kind of helps when you can see the problem, I guess. No dissection needed for further study. Right, just, just looking, just looking through you. That's pretty uh, intrusive. I don't know. Imagine being see-through all the time. Like, hey, pal, my eyes are up here. Quit staring at my pancreas. Number six, 
Tygons. Let tygons be bygones. Let's never do this, ever, please. I was gonna say liger, but that's been used before. We all know what that one looks like. Tygons were a real hybrid animal that you could see for yourself at both the London Zoo and the Manchester Zoo at one point in history. This was, of course, back in the late 30s where folks didn't bat an eye towards these kind of projects or these kind of things. Yeah, step on up and see the tygon. A tiger head and a lion body and a tiger tail all together to make a big old pile of holy yeah, that's what happens when you put animals in the same cage. Sometimes they get along a little too well. Tygon hybrids were seen long before the 90s as well. In 1837, for example, Queen Victoria was gifted a tygon. That's odd. They're like flowers or a hybrid creature. What do we give the queen? Number five. DIY. Not sure how many times I have to say this in life, but don't try any crossbreeding at home. Or ever, for that matter. Thanks. Keep it up. Because things obviously go south. For example, back in 2010, a woman named Julie Leroy, she was working as an animal control officer when an owner of a pit bull puppy said she didn't want to keep her. Okay, this happens often. But when Julie saw the dogs, she was in complete disbelief. She was like, yeah, I'll take this living animal. I'm not a monster. I can commit to this for sure. Thanks. People who abandon animals also, you're the devil. Don't do that. This dog, it was a hybrid animal. It wasn't healthy, but all the more reasons why you should stick around. The dog had a squid Squished up body, a huge jaw, and a bad underbite, and it was oddly shaped. But you gotta love him still. Look, he's so cute. God, I want him. A little bread dude. That's because the dog suffered from short spine syndrome. That's because they got the dog from a backyard breeding place who was carelessly breeding a bunch of these dogs together. Just no effort at all. No care. Thankfully, Julie did bring the dog home and gave her a loving time. Sweet little thing. Olivia and I want a dog so badly. I would definitely take this little hybrid lady in a heartbeat, for sure. A little bread bed for, oh, I love dogs. Even if they're, you know, hybrid and created in a backyard. Number four, glowfish. I never had a fish tank growing up. I don't know, not sure how I felt about a starfish just watching me sleep for hours on end. Back in 2012, Yorktown Technologies created hybrid glow fish. They were first created from zebra fish, but now there's a whole plethora of glow fish that you can purchase. Tiger barbs, rainbow sharks, you name it. Everything's glowy now. I guess to hype up Avatar 2, I don't know. I don't see why we needed hybrid glowfish. Why are we doing this? Can we stop? Bioluminescence is natural. We see octopus or deep sea fish that have it naturally. Scientists in Singapore were originally aiming to modify fish to spot toxins in polluted water in an easier way. Cool. But on one hand, you're like, oh, these fish are pretty beautiful. They're glowy. Can I have one, please? Alan Blake, co-founder of said Yorktown Technologies, wanted them to glow only when near toxins. Now, this was back in 2003 when they first started. Guy wanted real life notifications in the water. Cool. Today, we're at a point where glowfish are just being sold to houses for reasons. Just because. Do you want a glowfish? I don't know. Am I the only one that's like out of the loop with like the glowy fish vibe? Comment down below if a glowfish is something you want or now want. Oops, sorry. Number three, Savannah cats. This one's been talked about for a while now. How do we feel about Savannah cats? I wanna hear about this one as well. In May 2012, the International Cat Association registered this Savannah cat as a new breed. It's official, we got a new cat. Just, just what the world needs, more, more cats. I'm allergic, so, you know, pardon my beef. The international cat community confirms it. Now, it all started in the late 80s when Judy Frank crossbred a male several with a domestic Siamese. The offspring, in turn, was appropriately named Savannah. Yeah, now we have cats with big ass ears, and they're so cute. I can't help it, they are so cute. Domestic cats mixed with wild African cats. I mean, it sounds like you're gonna get a cat. I don't know how to tell you. This is like a science experiment that they're like, oh, it worked. And apparently they're great. Apparently they're not too crazy temper-wise, but they're fun and they're energetic. Great for families. Who knew? Better than glowfish, any day, any day. Number two, pig human. Scientists at the Salk Institute for Biological Scientists, what a mouthful that was, have created a human-pig hybrid. Yeah, in 2017, when worlds collide, let's do it. An embryo was placed in an adult pig for four weeks. And then when it was taken out and further analyzed, the embryos, not only one, survived, but they also contained some human cells. So their hope now was to grow human organs inside of pigs, instead of, you know, waiting for a donor. Impatient, but okay, we're listening. In 1910, zoologists figured out that it might even be possible to create hybrids between humans and their closest relatives as well. Yeah, no matter how this ends, either Planet of the Apes or Planet of the Pigs, I did my part, okay? I recycled. I didn't f with animal DNA, like Jurassic Park. I just kinda got a job, I don't know. 
hands are clean. And finally, number one, Stubbins Firth. We saved Firth for first. Let's do it. This is one of the craziest science projects I've ever heard of, so buckle up. Stubbins Firth, a researcher from Pennsylvania back in the late 1700s. First of all, as you can probably guess, methods back in the 1700s were often messy and pretty much illegal in every way. Firth was a doctor in training at the time, and he decided to prove to the world that yellow fever was not contagious. Yeah, imagine if you had Twitter. Firth would surgically insert vomit from his patients with yellow fever. He would insert vomit into his body. He would insert all their yuck into his wounds, all over his face, his eyes, you name it. He was trying to get it. He was going the extra, I'm gonna throw up. He was going the extra mile, all in the name of medical research. Even urine and saliva too. Anything yucky, just, he was just, ah, uh, he was rubbing it in. Firth, to all of our surprise, did not get sick. He was proud of that one. He told everybody the news loudly. He mansplained it at like 4 a.m. We look back now though and we realize Firth just sampled late stage patients. So they were further along. Much further, say, than the contagious period. So basically he volunteered to dump all the huh on his uh. Yeah, science. History is gross. Science as well, it gets a little messy sometimes. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have H.H. Holmes. This one is like the least fun double whammy ever, as this covers an evil doctor as well as America's first serial killer. Great, awesome combo. H.H. Holmes was a real piece of work, and it is said that his fascination with medicine started at a young age as he used to perform fictional surgeries on his stuffed animals. I just played with rocks, but all right. While it has never been confirmed, it is highly believed that his first victim may have been his childhood friend. H.H. Holmes went on to go to medical school and shortly after finishing he began killing people in order to steal their property. He then built himself a huge horrifying home that he had built to include things like secret passages and trap doors, soundproof rooms, doors that locked from the outside with gas jets on the inside, and he even had a kiln to cremate the bodies. I think it's safe to say he was absolutely terrifying and just the worst guy. Not only would he get close to women to take control of their finances and then kill them, but he would also require his employees to take out life insurance policies that named him as the beneficiary. Some of the bodies he even ended up selling to medical schools. Eventually he was found out, caught, and sentenced to death. It isn't exactly known how many victims he had, but it's thought to be somewhere over 200. Number 9. Thomas Cream This next one hits close to home for us in Canada. Thomas Cream originally graduated from McGill in 1876 and after that he traveled to London, England, not London. Ontario, that's important. This was during the time of the Industrial Revolution, so the demand for doctors was quite high. Thomas was there for business and apparently pleasure as well. He enjoyed London's nightlife. He would dance and drink and hook up with strangers, just all the things you want your medical doctor doing hours before a shift. Neat. But on November 15th, 1892, there were thousands gathered outside of the Newgate prison walls, eagerly awaiting the execution of one Dr. Thomas Cream. Well, now he's referred to as the Lambeth Poisoner, Cool nickname, not really, it's terrifying. If you had the misfortune of seeing this doctor, odds are he would just have tried to poison you just because he likes it. He actually did get caught once. He was convicted of poisoning a woman. He was given a life sentence in prison, but it's all about who you know, right? His brother bribed the governor of Illinois, so he poisoned five more people in London before eventually getting arrested again, and then finally executed for a large crowd. In our number eight spot today, we have Harold Shipman. Harold became a general practitioner in Lancashire, England after graduating from medical school, but in 1970, he ended up going into rehabilitation for a substance issue and for the writing of fraudulent prescriptions of the specific drug. In 1977, he ended up moving and starting a general practice that was doing quite well, but then some astute member of the community realized that Harold's patients were dying at quite high rates. Eventually, the case was passed on to the police, and it was at first believed that Harold should be cleared of all suspicion until the death of an 81 year old under mysterious circumstances. Her family demanded an investigation because they noticed that her insurance beneficiary had been changed to Harold, which reeked of forgery, as well as the fact that she had died shortly after a home visit from him, despite her being completely fine before his arrival. They ended up exhuming the body and found that she had actually passed away from a morphine overdose, and the timing of that overlapped with the time Harold had been in the home. After further investigation, it was also realized that Harold also encouraged all of the families of those who passed to cremate the bodies as as well as he jumped through a ton of hoops to assure them that the cause of death he wrote down was the true and real cause. 
Anyway, to make a long story short, he was the worst, and thankfully he was finally caught. He was tried and convicted of 15 counts of his crimes, but after his conviction, an audit estimated his number of victims to be around 236. Number 7. Michael Swango When he was just a child, Michael Swango did not collect rocks, he didn't spin Beyblades with the boys, rather he had scrapbooks filled with horrible car accidents, or any crime scene that's awful to look at. Young Michael Swango had the specs in his closet just ready to go. As if there weren't any red flags there already when Michael got to college, he decided to write his chemistry thesis on Georgi Markov. More specifically, he studied his horrific death caused by, you guessed it, poison. He was fascinated after that point. His newfound obsession was poisons and how they silently took lives. Now, During his third year at school, five patients that had the misfortune of seeing him just happened to die afterwards. His classmates had a nickname for him. They called him Double O in reference to James Bond, Licensed to Kill. That's a fun nickname. After an internship, people of course were starting to die off, but one individual survived. And she remembered that Swango had injected her with something just a minute before she started to experience seizures. Now he still got away with it somehow, then later on he went to another hospital in Ohio in 1984, handed out donuts that made his staff sick, and then when they required treatment, he would then poison them. He got caught, was sentenced to five years, but was released after two. He changed his name, moved to Virginia, got a job as a career counselor, and then poisoned those co-workers too. He got caught after doing this like three more times, and now he's serving three life sentences at ADX Supermax Federal Prison. This is actually insane. If I told you everything that he got away with, this video would be like 24 minutes long. In our number six spot today, we have Arnfin Nesset. Arnfin wasn't exactly yet a doctor, but he was studying to be one, so we'll let it slide for today. Day. At the time of his crimes, he was actually a nurse, and he ended up being charged for taking the lives of 22 different people. It is said that he committed these horrific crimes by injecting patients with a certain muscle relaxing drug. This worked particularly well because of the fact that this is a drug which over time becomes very hard to trace in the body. This not only worked to conceal the fact that he was committing these crimes for quite some time, but once people did catch on, it became very hard to prove his guilt. The investigations into his crimes took two years, and his trial ended up lasting five months. He was sentenced to only 21 years in prison because in Norwegian law, this is the maximum someone can be given, even if they're being sentenced for the killing of 22 people. Apparently he was released from prison in 2004 and he then changed his name and last I could find he was living somewhere in Norway. How terrifying. Number 5. Jane Toppin It's the 1800s and Jane Toppin aka Jolly Jane is confessing to 31 murders. With that nickname and that many victims, I already know you're going to be sick to your stomach. Jolly Jane Toppin was a nurse working in Massachusetts. She would take care of the elderly, but instead of TLC, Jane would give them morphine and atropine, and then while they were slowly fading away, Jane would do the absolute creepiest thing that I've ever heard in my entire life. She would poison these old folks and then lie in their bed with them as they were passing away. I got goosebumps reading this whole thing. Okay, She managed to cuddle away the souls of 31 patients before eventually getting caught. This one did get caught. She's not like out there still, thankfully. She spent the remainder of her days laying alone, thankfully, in an asylum. In our number 4 spot today, we have John Bodkin Adams. John was kind of similar to old Harold Boy we already talked about in the fact that he liked to not only kill his patients, but also commit fraud by making sure there was money or other valuables being left for him in their will. Like, how do these people not realize how obvious that is? I like my doctor, but not enough to gift him my house after I die. It is said that from 1946 to 1956, John had around 160 patients that died suspiciously, and that out of those 160, 132 of them left valuables for him. Of course, the wills were later found out to be fraudulent, because, yep. Want to know something wild though? John was acquitted. How? I'm not really sure, but his trial established the doctrine of double effect, which is where a doctor giving treatment with the aim of relieving pain may lawfully, as an unintentional result, shorten life. How insane is that? Anyway, that makes me upset. Number three. Jayant Patel. After training in India, Jayant became a surgeon in 1984. He began his career in Buffalo, New York. Great place to start. But it didn't take long for him to be fined. He was placed on probation for three years because he wouldn't check up on his patients before operating on them, which is insane. So later on, he was able to return, but his new co-workers witnessed him operating on their patients. The guy wouldn't even look at his own medical roster. He would just go to them and just start poking around for no reason. And a lot of the time, it would lead to their patients' death or serious 
serious injury. In 1998, he was prohibited from operating on the liver or pancreas, and when it came to any other surgery, he had to get a second opinion to go forward. This restriction was statewide come 2000, because three out of four cases ended up biting the bullet later on. He kept getting hired though still over and over, hiding his past of course, but eventually come 2013, Patel pleaded guilty to four charges of fraud. He served two years in prison only. That's a nice fact to end on. In our number two spot today, we have Carl Clawberg. I honestly wish I didn't even have to say this guy's name because he certainly isn't worth a spot in any of our brains. But unfortunately, part of us getting better is knowing the horrors of our past. This evil person was a German medical doctor during World War II, and he was one of many terrible people who conducted experiments on those in concentration camps. After receiving the rank of chief doctor and studying gynecology, he ended up becoming a professor in the field. In 1933, he joined the bad team, which unfortunately is not a word I can say on YouTube, so not to make light of it, but just so we're all on the same page, in 1933 he became a Yahtzee, and then in 1942 he approached another piece of work named Heinrich Himmler and suggested that they conduct some experiments of mass sterilization on women. Yep, and they did it! They assigned him to block number 10 in the camp, and since this evil person wanted to find the cheapest and easiest way to carry out this horrible mission, it was usually acid that was injected into a woman's uterus. Sometimes the patients would be killed just so that they could perform autopsies. It is estimated that around 300 women were unfortunately subjected to these specific experiments, but in even worse news, that doesn't even scratch the surface of the terrible things that were done to people during this time. And number one, Linda Hazard. Her last name really tried to warn us. She has since been dubbed the Starvation Doctor, because back in the day, the late 1800s of course, if you somehow ended up in the office of Hazard, it doesn't really matter what you're suffering with. Linda's advice, her medical advice, to pretty much for everything was just too fast. Yeah, broken collarbone you say, eh, skip lunch. More than 40 of her patients died due to, yep, starvation, and she had her own sanitarium in Washington appropriately named Starvation Heights. Sounds like a great place to go and heal. You would think after 16 deaths caused by starvation at Starvation Heights, people would start asking questions. Well, weird. Eventually, Major Chip Hazard was caught, convicted, served two years in prison, and then 26 years later in 1938, she herself died of starvation. You played yourself. Starting off our list at number 10, new bees. Great, sick of the old ones that sting you in the neck and then you're allergic? We got some new bees now to worry about, here we go. A lot of us know bees are pretty harmless and kind of cute, hairy little pollinators. Unless of course, like I mentioned, you're allergic or terrified of them. But truthfully, bees normally do a lot more good than harm, obviously, right? Save the bees. That was of course until an experiment in the 70s went south. Yeah, this experiment resulted in a new Bee, just a dangerous bee. The idea was to take a regular honey bee and breed it with a bee that is found in Africa that produces more honey. And of course the goal was to produce a manageable bee that would also be able to provide more honey than a regular honey bee. Good stuff, right? On paper this sounds like a step in the right direction. Well the bees that came out were a lot less manageable and they didn't even make more honey. Yeah, liars. You're fired, all 1,000 of you. Get out of here. After this experiment ended, however, the bees got out into the environment, and in the 80s, we saw the beginning of a massive trouble. These bees are not only aggressive towards other kind of bees, which creates a huge problem, but they're also very aggressive towards human beings. Nice. And when these guys sting, their stinger stays with them, so they can, you know, continue to Julius Caesar you how many times they want. The victims of these swarms receive 10 times the amount of stings as regular swarms, so. Horrible, horrible news. And they react to disturbances 10 times faster and they will also chase said disturbance a quarter of a mile. So, hope you can run really fast and really far. Number nine, Walfin. These guys were created when a female common bottlenose dolphin was bred with a male false killer whale. Yeah, we shouldn't be doing this. They're extremely rare and they have been found in the wild, but unfortunately, most of the ones that have existed were bred in captivity because humans are the worst. The first recorded Walfin was born in the Tokyo Sea World in 1981, and he very sadly died just 200 days later. Didn't even make it one year, horrible. Probably a prime example of why they maybe shouldn't exist in the first place. I don't know, just a wild observation. The first that was born in the United States that actually somehow survived was at Sea Life Park in Hawaii in May 1985, and her name was Kekamalu. She ended up having three babies. The first passed away after a few days, the second passed away at the age of nine, but thankfully the third one is still alive. In March last year, both Kekamalu and her daughter were still alive, but they remain, of course, in captivity. So it's like, great, but not, really not at the same time. Number eight, 
farm cattle. Back in the 90s, farmers in India were told that if they crossbred their cattle, they'd be able to breed cattle that could produce more milk, which in turn would mean more money for them and their families. Awesome, this should be amazing and great news, right? Well, considering why we're here watching, I don't think it's, uh, it's gonna end the way we think, no. Different breeds of bulls were brought in and farmers were expecting great results, but they ended up being stuck with cattle that did produce more milk, great, but they also needed way more food. They needed high quality food as well, or else they'd stop producing more milk and they were less resistant to the local diseases, so they required more veterinary visits. So it cost them more money, you know what I mean? Yeah, we got more milk, but we have to spend more money on maintaining the damn thing. It's not a win, it's not a win in my book. Number seven, old Buffalo Jones. Here we go, a guy named Charles Buffalo Jones. Let's talk about him. This man started breeding animals in 1906 because the bison population in Arizona at the time was exceptionally low. So bison were bred with domestic cattle in order to produce a hardy commercial animal. Nice, old Buffalo Jones getting his science on. He ended up just giving up on this and released the animals who were then managed by the state. And the numbers remained relatively low because of limited hunting licenses. Well, when the beefalo, good name, found their way into a national park where hunting is banned and therefore aren't any you know, natural predators, the population began to grow by 50% a year. That's a lot of beefalo. So none of this is necessarily bad, but it's the animal's environmental impact that has the real trouble. First off, they're very thirsty animals and they can consume 10 gallons each per trip to a watering hole. So they're sucking it all up, you know what I mean? It's like when you're in school and you're waiting for water and the guy in front of you just keeps drinking. You're like, oh my God, what are you doing? Where is this going? Not to mention the fact that they do their dirty business in the water and that basically just ruins it all. Basically, they've thrown the entire ecosystem off balance and have pushed out other animals and insects and plant life around have also been infected, all because they're thirsty and they like to take big shits where we all drink our water. Thanks, Beefalo. Number six, hybrid lion. Back in the 1980s, the Chatbir Zoo in Chandigarh, India, they started an experimental program where they would breed together a domestic lion, which is a bit smaller, has a less shaggy mane. They would breed that with an African lion in the hopes that they could be introduced to the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. Again, sounds like a great plan at first. How do we make it happen without making weird animals? The zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and then brought them in to breed with their other two Asiatic lions. Nice. Hey, we'll save ya. Just kidding, even worse. When the cubs were born, it was clear this was already a mistake as the cubs all had severely weak back legs. They were all shaky. They were having extreme trouble walking and as they got older, their immune system started to fail more and more. Sadly, by 2000, they had bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions and they finally decided to stop the program and all the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any reproduction further. There's also laws that prohibited them from killing animals so they were simply just waiting around for them to die naturally. It's kind of a weird circle we got. It too. When there's a dwindling population of lions, it's insane to me that they just wasted 20 years trying to do this when they could have just simply bred the lions that they had. You know what I mean? It was right there and they're like, all right, now let's try something new. It's like, what? No, why? Number five, Kunga. Perhaps the earliest example of human-animal hybrid testing, here we go, halfway through, time to turn it up a bit. Scientists recently learned about this donkey hybrid that roamed ancient Mesopotamia. Now this was a time before even horses arrived, so they had to do something, right? Large kungas would pull wagons and smaller ones would help pulling plows. These little guys, they were the talk of the town. Imagine hybrid animals before horses. No wonder they were a status symbol. 4,000 years ago, they were given as gifts for weddings. Yeah, yeah, yummy, I wonder what this one is. It smells a little stinky. After so long, scientists are finally able to figure out what exactly a kunga was a hybrid of. It was a female donkey and a male Syrian wild ass. And it's a wild ass over there. Hey, nice wild ass. It's wild what you can still learn from ancient animal bones from even thousands of years ago. It's mind blowing. More amazing how involved this hybrid was in Mesopotamian culture. Do we bring back the kunga? I don't know. Number four, super cow. Moo, but with a lot of O's. Just tons of a moo, just a mighty moo. Introducing the super cow. All right, start your day off with some super milk and then have a super stomach ache and shit your super pants. Only in Belgium, let's do it. Back in the 1800s, scientists and farmer brought together native cattle and short horn cattle. After that, they would literally pick the biggest of the bunch and then have them breed together. These cows are officially called Belgian blues, but I will continue to call them super cows. Thank you very much. I can't even look at these guys. They're disturbing. They look like bodybuilders. That makes no sense. They have like eight biceps, the incredible Hulk just with more milk. Number three, the mouse with an ear on its back. Oh, I want to Q-tip this guy every time I see him. The mouse with a human ear, folks. How did this happen? This is like the world's greatest mouse spy. Stuart Little's evil brother. Let's do it. 
Back in 1997, this Vacanti mouse became the test subject to determine if scientists could grow cartilage using chondrocytes, aka cells from a cow. And clearly it worked a little too well. It's a little odd what we have. We're still talking about it, obviously, it's weird. It all started when Joseph Vacanti, a pediatric surgeon, began designing human organs. This was during a shortage in time. He wasn't just bored and started to make ears. He was changing the medical game. And little did he know, he was about to change the science game as well. He constructed an ear and he told his brother Chuck and his partner Bob to not bring up the fact that he attached said ear to a live mouse. Kind of hard to bring up, but we'll do our best. Okay. Chuck failed. He spilled the beans almost right away. But now we know that cow cartilage can create human cells. That's great. I want a Q-tip his back. Is that weird? That's not weird. It gives ear cheese a whole new meaning. We're gonna throw out. Number two, the Zorse. I'll give you a second to figure out what animal this is. Nice, there you go. Male zebra, female horse. Now we've got a really fun word. Zebroids are also quite common historically. Charles Darwin even noted some in his work. So since the 19th century, crossbreeding zebras with horses and donkeys, it's all been done. More often than not, and this is what makes them stand out, zebroids will experience dwarfism. It's pretty cute. In 2010, a zedonk was born, a zebra donkey. All these fun names, right? But again, back in the 70s, three were born in Colchester Zoo. These zookeepers were like, hmm, how do we make zoos new and hip and bizarre? Are. Oh, I know. Humans are not great. Humans are too bored, it seems. And finally, number one, Hiramitsu Nakauchi. Stem cell biologist from Tokyo. This last one is too wild. Just recently, his experiments have been approved by the government, so things are actively in play here. Not old Farmer Joe in the early 1900s. No, we're getting to modern science now. Hiramitsu hopes to grow human cells inside mice and rats, right? Like we just talked about. But then he wants to transplant those embryos into surrogate animals. A lot of animals, a lot of cells, a lot of traffic going in and out. Cells into rats and mice embryos, how do we even get here? We went from Salem witch trials to rodents being genetically manipulated so they can make pancreases for you. What? But his hope here was that the rodents' bodies will be used for human cells to then make a pancreas for themselves. So it's kind of like a kickoff into biology, right? Here's the thing, while conducting said experiments, they found out that rats were starting to develop a human-type brain. Yeah, that's when they decided to pull the plug, rightfully so. The second humans and animals get too close, governments come in and they go, hey, stop. Thanks. In our number 10 spot, we have Johann Conrad Dippel. Dippel was a scientist that is known for creating the elixir of life. An elixir that, yes, would keep you living for as long as you would like. It was called Dippel's oil. He tried to trade the elixir for Frankenstein's castle once. Obviously, the owners didn't fall for it. Or at least they didn't believe in its worth. But I bet you're wondering, why was he thought to be so evil? Well, probably because he used to experiment on himself and dead bodies. And he claimed that he even transferred the soul of one body to another, even though no one could ever confirm this as the bodies were, well, deceased. He also claimed to have a way of releasing demons from bodies. Man, I wonder if that's documented anywhere. We can all use an exercise for releasing demons, you know what I mean? In our number nine spot, we have Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons is known for being a rocket scientist, but also a follower of the occultist Aleister Crowley. He is believed to be someone who was in direct contact with the devil and did experiments, aka spells, on on himself. He was the reason for the advancement of liquid fuel and solid fuel rockets. He was unable to continue being a scientist when news of his occult ways became public knowledge. Apparently, he worked with the founder of Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard, to summon the god Babylon to Earth. He died in an at-home explosion from an experiment that he was doing. Jack is a tricky one because obviously everyone was so Christian and Catholic back then that they would have thought him to be evil, but I don't know. I really wonder if this is one of those cases where, you know, they were wrong and maybe he was just a nice guy. I don't know. In our number eight spot, we have the Tuskegee scientists. The scientists that participated in this experiment are legit pure evil. There was a study done called the Tuskegee study where 600 African American males, 399 who were suffering with syphilis and 201 who weren't, and these men were being tricked into thinking that they were being treated for the illness, when really 
they were dying off, except the ones that didn't have it, of course. They were the success stories, of course. But what was the purpose of this? Well, to study their corpses. They couldn't have thought to just ask them if they could study their bodies once they die. Why did this happen, and even for as long as it did, which was 40 years, from 1932 to 1972? So evil. Reparations were eventually paid to the victims of the study, but nothing could make up for the horrible feeling they must have felt from going through that experience. In our number 7 spot, we have Dr. Sigmund Rascher. This is a scientist that needed to be mentioned because of how evil he was. However, it is unclear as to whether he experimented on himself at all throughout his life. Rasher is considered one of the most evil scientists in the world from World War II. He worked at a camp and apparently experimented on 300 unwilling people in high altitude freezing experiments. Victims were locked in a pressure chamber where the altitude was being continuously adjusted and they would feel as if they were falling out of a plane. He would also place them in freezing environments naked to perform tests. Of course, this led to many deaths. He was asked to do this on monkeys, but demanded humans. Clearly a very sick and awful man. In our number 6 spot, we have Shiro Ishii. There is a man that is known as Surgeon General Shiro Ishii, and he was a scientist and medical officer for the Japanese Imperial Army. In fact, he led the biological warfare unit that is known as 731. He's also known for being just plain evil as he would experiment on Chinese prisoners and regular civilians. He used biological weapons that is said to have caused tens of thousands of deaths, including the bubonic plague, cholera, and anthrax. He would also conduct other evil experiments on his patients, including forced ab and simulated hypothermia. It is unclear if he experimented on himself, as I'm sure he wouldn't have given himself the bubonic plague, but it is clear that he was very, very evil. In our number five spot, we have Max Joseph von Pettenkofer. Max was a scientist that wasn't so much evil as he was seemingly insane, as he did an extremely risky experiment on himself. Apparently, in 1892, he wanted to disprove the theory that cholera bacteria alone was the cause of the disease. In the presence of witnesses, Max swallowed some broth with a large dose of cholera bacteria. He apparently also consumed some sodium biocarbonate to neutralize the acids in his stomach after it was suggested that the acid could kill the bacteria. Apparently he suffered only minor symptoms and what he did experience, he says, wasn't due to the bacteria. To me, he just sounds like he was either a little insane or just so sure of himself that it wasn't a risk at all. And even then, I would say to be that sure of yourself to take that big of a risk means you have to be a little insane. In our number 4 spot we have Klauberg, another man who is known to be one of the most evil scientists in the world. Klauberg was a scientist in World War II that started off experimenting on himself, but then eventually switched to experimenting on a large amount of women in camps and what was his purpose? Oh, to sterilize them all. He apparently experimented on hundreds injecting formaldehyde into their stomachs without any painkillers, as well as it is said that he also injected animal sperm into some of the women to see if he could create an animal-human hybrid. Absolutely horrifying. In our number 3 spot we have Joseph Mengel, another German scientist from World War II that was said to have had evil intentions. He weirdly had an interest in young humans humans and twins, and a lot of his experimentation was around them. The most disturbing thing about him was his ability to seem so kind and charming and have everyone like him, but then in the next moment, he would be the reason a bunch of people were sentenced to death. A true psychopath, and it's the seemingly kind ones that always leave you with shivers. He has a nickname and is known as the Angel of Death. In our number 2 spot, we have Peter Neubauer. In the 60s and 70s, a secret experiment 
experiment was done, led by a scientist by the name of Peter Neubauer, that separated twins and triplets from each other and they were adopted as singles. Apparently, this experiment was funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, and the purpose of this experiment is still unclear. To separate living humans from their family, all for the sake of science, is truly just evil, in my opinion. The experiment was discovered in the 80s after three identical brothers accidentally found each other. I can't even imagine what that must have felt like to be them. I suppose this experiment isn't as horrible as some of the other ones we have listed today, but it still is terribly sad to think about all of these people, you know, missing out on growing up with their brothers and sisters. It is unclear whether Peter's decision to lead this was part of his job and therefore through slight force, as it was being funded by a big organization, or whether he pushed for this to be done. In our number one spot, we have Vladimir Demikov. So this is, in my personal opinion, one of the most evil scientists, but honestly, there are so many evil ones on this list that it's really hard to say who should take first. So I'm giving it to Vladimir Demikov. Vladimir is a Soviet scientist that is known for performing the evil act of beheading many dogs and then re-sewing them onto other dogs' bodies. He did this for 15 years. Why? Oh, because apparently he was bored. Apparently, he was known to experiment on himself and also he pioneered organ transplants, which is just so hard to digest that he could have been the founder of something that has done so much good for the world, while on the other hand, he committed unthinkable evil acts. Life is so strange. Mm -hmm.